cut it fought through the angry clouds and it pierced into the bright blue which was arrayed with the beautiful rays of the unblemished sun and suddenly as we were above the clouds they now seemed like an ocean of white fluff and we cruised peacefully what a contrast to what was underneath the clouds you pierce through the clouds you start seeing that actually the clouds are just below and as you fly higher you're like wow this is so beautiful the sky is blue the sun is shining God's creation is so amazing and you are flying above the clouds because you didn't jump off when things got hard you didn't reject Christ when things got hard but you held on you held on in your relationship you held on in your marriage even when it felt like giving up you said Lord I said before you until death do us apart I am going to hold on but I don't trust myself I trust the pilot I trust Jesus who elevates with me who flies me into a safer place he is my refuge he is my strength he is my anchor he is my joy when I'm sad he is my provider when I'm in need he is my protector when I'm threatened his presence is my power. I hold on to him. We say that time flies when you are having a blast. By show of hands, who's heard that term before? Time flies when you've, <laughs> you're having a blast. Right, so most of you have heard that, that term. And what does it stand for? It means that when you're having a good time, time moves at an incredible speed. And so the actual word blast, though, it is not necessarily a good thing, if I may use that term, in a sense that, you know, when there's a blast in your house, it's usually not a good thing. A blast stands for an explosion. At best, a blast is damaging to stuff, but at worst, it leads to catastrophes. But be that as it may, in our daily colloquialism, we use the term blast to mean that we are having fun. Now, for me, growing up, or not growing up, August of 2006, when I was at working for a particular company, I had just received a, a promotion. And so this is my recollection of time when I was both moving at an incredible speed, but also having the time of my life. And what had just happened was that I was promoted and I was staying in Peter Marisburg at the time, and our company was expanding and I was tasked to head up a new department or actually start a new department up here in Gauteng. And that meant I got to fly in an aeroplane. And if you know, Peter Marisburg doesn't have huge airplanes like King Shark or Tambo and the Cape Town International Airport. It is one of those small airports where you have the uh, uh, SAA uh, Air Link, I almost said Road Link. We don't have Road Link anymore. Uh, S -S -A, -A, a Link, which is one of the smaller airplanes. And I do remember that day that. At that stage, I was incredibly overjoyed to have this opportunity. And my mother at that stage also came with me. Now, you must understand the context here. My mom never dreamed of being in an aeroplane. At least at that stage, she had not also been in an aeroplane. And so to her, So she told all she knew, everyone she knew, that her young boy would be up in the air flying, you know. And you know, so I allowed her to enjoy that moment. Just she was living the flight on my behalf, even before we went, we went to the flight. So as much as I was just moving from Peter Marisburg to Joburg, to her, I may as well have been taking a trip to the moon. That's how it was received by her. Before we got there. We go to the check-in counters, and she could not go in, and I could get, get in because obviously I had a ticket. But because it's a small aeroplane, she could just see from the distance, like not even from the distance, like it was actually smaller than this building, the actual building we went through. And so you could see right through the glass windows where the aeroplane would be. And so she waved me goodbye, and she was overjoyed. There was a little bit of sadness that I won't be seeing her. But ultimately, she was overjoyed to see me hop onto the plane. And then at that moment, I remember sitting down and just soaking up this particular moment. And the engines rumbled and roared. And the breeze that was gentle a few moments before 
suddenly turned angry and beat against the aeroplane. And the world and its roads and rivers seemed to be sliding all together in the opposite direction at incredible speeds. Its nose lifted. And at that time, it was, it was overcast. It was just before it was going to rain. So there were storm clouds that had gathered. And so its nose lifted. Gravity lost its grip. And then it fought off the angry clouds. And I do remember at that time that uh, as much as I pretended to be calm, I was the furthest thing from being calm, especially because it's those small aeroplanes that struggle through the clouds. And so it was like, <laughs> and so we're moving up. And so I looked at everybody, people who are reading things, reading books, you know, and I just pretend to be calm. I'm like, God be with me. I'm just praying, just in case anything happened. But it fought through the angry clouds and it pierced into into the bright blue, which was arrayed with the beautiful rays of the unblemished sun. And suddenly, as we were above the clouds, they now seemed like an ocean of white fluff. And we cruised peacefully. What a contrast to what was underneath the clouds. And this lends me to the title of my message this morning, which is, Lift Off in the Spirit. Lift off in the Holy Spirit. And it is the first installment of our Who Can Be Against Us series. And I'm not going to go too much into the details of the context. And I'm going to encourage you, if you were not here last week, do, there's going to be a YouTube that's going to come out tomorrow. Go and watch that to get just a context of where we are as far as Paul is concerned with Romans 8. And I want to submit this, is that when we... Like the main thing, though, that you need to know as far as context is concerned is that Paul is not just speaking to unbelievers. He is speaking to Christians. It is a message. It's an epistle that is addressed to believers. And I want us to read and, again, go slowly through this particular passage of Scripture. And we're reading from Romans 8, verses 1 to 13. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according, I want you to underline that, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. Those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit God's law. Nor can it do so. Underline that too. Nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. Only though, if, if only Christ or the spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not be belong to him. Paul is not ambiguous. If the spirit of Christ is not in you, they do not belong to him. But if... Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, then he says, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives 
in you. But it doesn't stop there. He then says, this is what we're going to focus this morning. He says, therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. Other translation says, we have a debt. Let it be clear to you. But it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. It is a promise. It is not a maybe. You will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. It's another promise. And I'm submitting this is a promise that has conditions attached to it. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. In other words, if you live according to the flesh, you will go to hell. And you might be listening here and saying, no, Timber, that's not the, the, the gospel that I've received. In actual fact, how can you say that? You know, growing up, one thing I've always I've, I had learned to, to, to look at sermons and divide them into two things. I would say there's what is called a salvation sermon. And there's what is called an edification sermon. But I have been increasingly being convicted that all edification sermons are salvation sermons. All edification sermons are salvation sermons. As I said, underline, the main thing about the context that you need to grasp here is that Paul is speaking to none other than believers. And so you may be, no, but Timber, it's okay, I understand the importance of fighting sin, but don't threaten my eternal security by my sin or by highlighting my sin. And I'm going to submit that to you, that is the flesh speaking to you. Paul knows that as he writes this letter, those who are his, those who are in the spirit, when they hear sermons like this, it resonates with their spirit. There's nothing that rises up in retaliation to that message. And that is a message that says, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. You will go to hell. Whether you said you, are, you, you, said you believe or not. What I mean by that is that your, your faith is not an empty word. There has to be sincerity in your heart. There has to be the spirit of God that comes in. There has to be a loving of truth. There has to be a trusting of Christ. There has to be a living in the spirit for you to become saved. And that is what Paul is saying here. And I read this message and I'm like, sure, Paul, you're throwing rocks here. And by the way, he says later, who can be against us? This is the context that is often omitted. Many people, who can be against us because God is with us? But you see, there is a precondition of this Romans 8 of saying you have to be living in the spirit. If you are living in the flesh, all sorts of things are against you. And all sorts of things will defeat you. And all sorts of things will kill you. And all sorts of things will take you to hell. And I'm saying this, when you come in Brahm, at least one day when you stand before God, you can never say, we never gave you the truth. We spoke the truth from the bottom of our hearts. And it is intended with the greatest of a heartfelt heart that understands the devastation. And even as I think about this, is that, I struggle, I'm struggling to compose myself because it is an emotional thing that if you live according to the flesh, you will die. It is not just somebody concocting something that is designed to scare you. You will die. On the 24th of December this month, we all watched on our screens and our phones as a terror, a horrific, heart-wrenching, accident happened in Boxburg. A blast that I, I saw things that I'd never seen before. I'd never seen somebody's flesh and their, and their clothes melt over them and drip down like a candle wax on a burning candle. But we saw that in that Boxburg explosion. And when I look at the Boxburg explosion, I realize something. I am yet to meet somebody who said, it was a good thing that those people died like the way they did. Everybody was broken hearted. It was a painful moment. We prayed. Others who were around who were able to rush and help. But even people interviewed on television couldn't compose themselves. They started weeping. Nobody was celebrating. 
And then let's take back and say, well, apparently, and I'm not sure if this is true or not, that the driver and some people, including the, 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 the workers that had come or the EMS workers, the rescue emergency services, were warning people and say, stay away from there. And they were saying, stay away from this truck because you will perish. And I'm here submitting anyone who said those words to somebody that is living today, whoever that is, they're eternally grateful for somebody who told them about the Boxburg blast before it blew up. They love them. It is a gracious warning. This portion, this portion of scripture, it is a gracious warning from God. It's a gracious warning through the lips of the Apostle Paul. It is a gracious warning. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. We live in a world that elevates offense. You see, I don't care if you offend me or don't offend me just before a boxer blast. Even if you clap me and you drag me and you did a WWE slam dunk and threw me on the other side of the way, I would thank you for that because I would be living today. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But you see, Jesus has made a way for us to escape. He has made a way for us to escape. You see, now picture this. Peter Maritzburg, a whole of Peter Maritzburg represents the entire world. It represents everybody that's living throughout time and history. It represents all of us, those who have lived before us and those who live now. There is something in the air. You see, the issue here is sin is just like that Boxburg blast. You see, that gas that came out of there. The first thing sin is, if you notice, is that some people were there because they were attracted to what was going on. Because they were attracted to what was going on, that whole scene had spectator value. And it elicited some curiosity. And sin is just the same. Sin is attractive. It makes you stop. Wherever you're going, you deviate because you want to be a part of it. You have FOMO. You don't want to miss out. And you go and start fiddling with what is going on. That is exactly sin. what sin is like. Another thing that happened was the gas was invisible. It was not, you could not see it, but it was in the air. The effects of it were there. The driver himself, he collapsed after inhaling. After he had inhaled the gas, apparently it was, it was incoherent and he suddenly collapsed. Sin does the same thing. You see, when you inhale sin too much and you don't repent for small sins and what kind of stuff Paul says, the Bible says eventually your conscience is like, like, it's like it been, it's been seared with the hot iron. And then Paul goes on to say, God gives you over to a reprobate mind when you believe wrong is right. When you start believing your lies, it's okay, I can sleep with this one, that's not my wife, it's okay, I'm saved by the grace, I can impregnate that person, I can smoke that, or do all those things, I can kill that person, I can lie about that, it's green lies, it's yellow lies, whatever it is, you begin to learn to justify, you begin to learn to justify your own sin. And you see, the issue you don't realize, you have lost your consciousness. You have lost your ability to critically evaluate what's wrong and right. The driver lost his consciousness after inhaling too much of that gas. After inhaling too much of that sin, it, you will lose your ability to, to be conscious. Another thing that it does, there was warnings. Those things have warnings all the time. And apparently the EMS, they put like barricades and they tried to push people away. But the warning was understated. And it's what we do. We understate the warning. We understate, therefore, it says, it says, you will die if you live according to the flesh. We understate that warning. And that's what they did. And the last thing I want to mention about the Boxburg Blast, as it relates to sin, is that it is absolutely deadly. It is absolutely devastating. Even as we speak today in this church, we are still reaping the chaos and the wounding of a sin that was committed right here with the past leader of this church through adultery. We are still picking up the pieces of an explosive, sinful adultery within the house of God. Sin is destructive. You see, there were people who were warned and they went to the direction of the, of the truck. 
And as they went to the direction of a truck, they knew that there was a truck they'd been warned. They didn't listen. But there were other people who are minding their own business, working at Boxburg Hospital, taking care of innocent people. People walking by have no idea what's going on. Some people still sleeping in their houses. But when the eruption happened, it devastated everything that was around it. That's the way sin works. That's what happens. That when you do stuff, it has consequences within a community. It, it's like, a, it's like a, a bomb that has been set off and it just causes devastation and catastrophe. That is sin. And never look lightly on sin ever as long as you say, I have the Spirit of God. And so I'm going, I've got five things to help us. How do we evade this? How do we avoid? How do we hop onto the plane? How do we run away before the explosion happens? Number one, I've used the acronym BLAST. Number one, board with bold faith. Board with bold faith in none other than Jesus Christ. That I don't trust in my own strength. I trust in what Jesus did. I board with bold faith. Paul says in, in Romans chapter 1, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God to save. No, no closet Christians. People know that I believe. People know that I love God. The way I do things, the stuff that I speak about, the places you find me, the words that come out of my mouth, the way I handle myself, it speaks to the fact that I have bold faith. I am not putting it under. Jesus said, the Bible says, who has a light and puts it under a table? You put it up for everybody to see. Board with bold faith. Number two is lift off in the spirit. Not in your own strength, but you lift off in the power of the spirit. Now, as I said again, you see, Jesus says this to us. He says, I have come to fulfill the law. He never said he's come to scrap the law. But he said, I have come to fulfill the law. That's what Jesus said. I have come to fulfill the law. In other words, there is a law that we, that there is a requirement. He says that in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. He condemns sin in the flesh. And so Jesus fulfills the righteous requirement of the law. Now, picture this. You see, living in Peter Maritzburg, being promoted meant I had an assignment to do in Gauteng. And that assignment, I had to be there within a day. Now, there's two options. It's either I walk to Joburg and I'll be here in a day. Or I hop on the plane, I will be there in no time. And that is the difference between being in the flesh and being in the spirit. Because it says, for what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his only son. Jesus comes like the pilot to help us get there within an hour. It takes an hour from Maritzburg to, to, to Ortambo Airport to fly here. But you see, if I would be walking, even running, I don't care whether you are Hal Selassie, you are William Dollar, Bruce Fordyce, or even Usain Bolt, whoever is a, is a great runner, you will never make it from Peter Marisburg to Joburg in a day. In fact, you won't even make it in two days. It will take you 123 hours to get here. Two weeks to be exact. Each day, you walk eight hours nonstop, no pit stop, no sickness, nothing. And so to think you can do it in a day, is an, it's just an impossible thing. And that's the law. And the law requires us to go to other places, but it, it needs the, the, the instruments, the material it has. It's weak. It is the flesh. And what is that law? Jesus gives it to us in Matthew 22, 37. He says, listen, he says, that all the law is in this one thing. Love God with everything and love your neighbor as yourself. Paul says the same thing in Romans 13. It says, it says thou shall not steal, thou shall not envy, thou shall not murder, thou shall not lust and commit adultery. He says all these things are, 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 are fulfilled in the one law. Love your neighbor as yourself. So you can see 
that there is still a requirement. There is still a destination. And the destination is to love God with everything and love neighbor as ourselves. But as long as we use the flesh, we use the law, we cannot get there. And so the Holy Spirit becomes an airplane that helps us to move from where we are and we head into, into the calling that God has for us. But you see, there's another thing. The law of gravity. You see, when the aeroplane was flying, the law of gravity was still there. The law of sin and death. What does the Bible say? He says, or this portion of scripture says to us, therefore there's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death is like gravity. It drags you down. Sin and death, we all sin. We all die. It drags us down. I, it doesn't matter how much I jump, how many times I stay in the air, I still must come down because the law of gravity reigns supreme. So what happens? He says the law of the Spirit... The law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free. How does it do that? You see, the law of gravity exists as we hit the runway and the nose started lifting. What happened? Gravity lost its grip. You know why? The law of aerodynamics kicked in. A superior law to the law of gravity kicked in. Gravity has no power over the law of aerodynamics. Sin and death has no power over the law of the spirit. And so when you operate in the spirit, you begin to elevate. And you are able to conquer what you could not conquer before. And that is what Paul is basically saying to us. And suddenly what happened is, obviously as I took up, as I, as I started rising, is the next point, is adopt an aerial view. Adopt an aerial view. An aerial view it's critical. You see, while things were at the bottom there, so many things were larger than me. Small buildings were bigger than me. Cars were bigger than me. But suddenly, the higher we got, I could hardly see some of the cars. Even large mountains looked like pimples on somebody's face. And that's what happens when you elevate in the law. Even the things that we trip over, offenses that are loomed, that loom large like mountains, we are able to forgive because it becomes insignificant. The higher we go, the less significant the things that bothered us when we were on the ground become. Because we now are moving in the Holy Spirit. And I said again, we, we, we encountered clouds. There were, there were storm clouds. And I was terrified. I was scared that, hey, I am not going to be able to make it through. I'm not going to be able to survive being in, in this airplane. I wish I could go back down. Get a pilot say, let's really move. Because now this cloud thing is not working out for me. But the best thing I could do at that moment is trust the pilot. Is hold on. The best thing you can do as you decide to choose Jesus, it's not going to be easy. There's going to be storm clouds. There's going to be storms that are going to be there. And they're going to be rattling the plane. As they rattle the plane, the best thing you can do is trust the pilot and trust Jesus. Trust that the pilot Jesus is going to take you safely through the clouds. Don't feel like, no, I need to go back down to the ground. No. The ground, the, the box big explosion is still to come. But what you do, you knife in, you, you, you stay put. The Bible says, be still and know that I'm God. Put on your seatbelt and head through the clouds. And when you pierce through the clouds, you start seeing that actually the clouds are just below. And as you fly higher, you're like, wow, this is so beautiful. The sky is blue. The sun is shining. God's creation is so amazing. And you are flying above the clouds. Because you didn't jump off when things got hard. You didn't reject Christ when things got hard. But you held on. You held on in your relationship. You held on in your marriage. Even when it felt like giving up, you said, Lord, I said before you, until death do us apart, I am going to hold on. But I don't trust myself. I trust the pilot. I trust Jesus who elevates with me, who flies me into a safer place. He is my refuge. He is my strength. He is my anchor. 
He's my joy when I'm sad. He's my provider when I'm in need. He's my protector when I'm threatened. His presence is my power. I hold on to him. He will land me safely. He who began a good work shall finish it. And we are talking about Jesus. And so another thing that Paul then said to us, he says, those who are in the flesh of their minds set on what the flesh desires. Those on the ground have their minds on what the mind, what's going on down there in the ground. But those who are in the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death. They're going to all die. The explosion is going to kill them. Some are already being killed within our culture because of all the toxic stuff that we hear. We hear all sorts of toxic things that are being, that are being exuded from our culture. What do we hear? I mean, whether it's things that we, we, we can't define our roles as, as the way God defined them, that we can choose what gender I want to be. But what is the issue is that we start swallowing in that toxic gas and our minds are down there. But if you're in the spirit, there's life. But what the, he, he continues, he says, the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law. It wants to redefine what God says is clear. It wants to redefine what if God says, I'm a I'm temper, I'm a man, it wants to define that. If God says it's good to be married to a husband, between a husband and a wife, it wants to define that. If God says don't live in the flesh, it wants to say, no, 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 you can, it's okay, live in the flesh. Do all this thing, drink until you forget what your name is. Drink and, and, and party all night and forget about the gospel and smoke yourself to the grave. Whatever it is, just keep doing that. But it on goes on to say, the mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. It is powerless to submit to God's law. It cannot. And that's why we need the Spirit. The engine of this airplane and the fuel is the Holy Spirit that allows that airplane to begin to fly to where God is calling us, you and I, to go to. And the last two things I want to leave you with is, number one, is search your heart. I was praying that psalm earlier on, that God search me. And David also says this in Psalm 138, search my heart and know my ways, search me. Is that we need to search our own hearts, begin to search. I'm going to ask the band to come up as well, as we're going to worship now. We pray that God search my heart. Every day search me. How do we do that? We commune with God. We, 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 we read his word. Paul says, in Romans 7 verses 7, if it was not for the law, I would have not known what sin was. If it was not because of the law, I would have not known what sin was. And so how do I know what I'm sinning? It is because I spend time in the word. I, I look at the word and I begin to go through what the word is saying. And that's how I search my heart. The Holy Spirit searches me. I invite the Holy Spirit in me. He searches me. He convicts me. He says, that's right. That's wrong. You need to forgive that situation. You're overreacting there. You shouldn't even be in this place too long. Speak to that person. On Thursday, I happened to use an Uber. And I just sensed the Spirit saying to me, speak to this guy. Ask to pray for him. And I sensed that he may even be a believer. And it turned out he was a believer. And he was grateful for the prayer. I'm not going to spend too much time there. But I'm just giving an illustration that the Holy Spirit begins to speak to us. It, it nudges us. It tells us, do that, don't do that. Search your heart. The last point is take action. Take action. Take action against sin before it takes action against you. Take action before it explodes. Run to the refuge, which is Jesus Christ. Don't just wait there. Take action. For me, I struggled for a very long time with an alcoholic addiction. But there was a point when I was fed up and I said, God, you have got to deliver me. I began to pray. I fasted 21 days upon 21 days. I read the New Testament from, from cover to cover, from Matthew to Revelation. And I went back again, Matthew to Revelation. Every time I stumbled, I went back and I said, I'm going to pray. I'm going to fast. Until I was delivered. 
That's what Paul is saying. You must, through by the Holy Spirit, put to death the misdeeds of the flesh. And that's the action we must take. Whatever your sin is, take action. If it's lying, ask somebody to hold you accountable. If it's lust, ask somebody to hold you accountable. Pray. Don't watch the things that will elicit that. For me, I had to stay away from, from pubs and things that are like where people are just drinking to oblivion. There are certain friends I had to stay away from because I was fighting my sin. Because I understand it will destroy me. And the issue is sometimes it, I don't even have to wait for hell for sin to destroy you. Because drunkenness will kill you while you are living. It will destroy your family. It will destroy your kids. It will destroy your goals. It will destroy the things you've spent years working for. Never mind the whole bigger question of eternity. But the bigger goal and the bigger win for sin is death and eternal separation from God. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. But it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the flesh, you will live. Amen. I'm going to ask us all to stand up and worship. And we're going to have a time of response even after this, after we worship. Amen. Every breath we could ever live for.